last video, I mentioned that I was going to show some different ways of hooking up motors to these stands that I make. Today I was going to show how to do a direct wire hookup and I'm going to do that on a 10 RPM motor that I'm going to use on one of my stands that I'm selling on eBay. I'll put a link in this video in the description and I'll also put a link in the top right hand corner under the info button if you want to check those stands out and it will turn at 10 RPMs and you can use that to dry your epoxy after you put it on. I'm also going to show a new type of remote control unit that I was testing out. I found this unit on Amazon. It's quite a bit more expensive than one I've shown in a previous video. This unit's about $20. The other one that I showed before, it's somewhere around $5. But I wanted to test this unit out and see if it might provide a little more low end speed without stalling the motor. And it's really easy to hook up too. So I'm going to show you how I'm hooking that one up as well. The power adapter I'm using is from a Netgear modem. It's a 12 volt adapter and it has about two amps on the output of it. I'm just going to cut off the plug on the end and separate the two wires that went to the plug. And I'm going to strip those back using an inexpensive wire stripper crimper tool. You can use it to strip wires and you can also use that same tool to crimp a terminal I'm going to show you here in just a minute on the ends of the wires as well. And I'm just going to strip these wires back somewhere around a little less than a quarter of an inch and I'm going to strip the two ends that I separated. I'm using some small gold plated terminals. They're female disconnects and they're made to fit wire gauge sizes from 22 to 18 gauge wire and the disconnects the distance across the spade of it is 0 0.110 inch. They're really small terminals. You can also find these on Amazon listed as 2.8 millimeter female quick disconnects. They're made to go on spade terminals that are smaller in size like these motors have. They're also used a lot in audio connections for speakers in cars and trucks. So you can find these a lot of times at auto parts stores. I found the ones that I'm using here on this video. I found those at O'Reilly Auto Parts. And since these are made with a red end on them, that means that you'll use the part of the crimper tool that is marked with a red dot. And all you do is put the stripped end up into the metal part of this crimp on connector and crimp it down using the red dot section of the crimper tool. And you'll want to use the insulated side of the crimper tool. There's a non-insulated side and the insulated side. The non-insulated side puts an indentation in the metal that uses a pointed part of the crimper to actually make that indentation. The smooth side of the crimpers that are marked with the red dot are made to be used on the insulated ends of these terminals and it prevents the insulation from being torn basically in that area. Once you get the terminals crimped onto the ends of the wire, it holds pretty securely so you shouldn't have any problems with the wires pulling out. And because this is a direct wire setup that I'm using for this particular setup using the 10 RPM dryer type motor, it really doesn't matter which connection you put on positive and negative on the motor other than putting them one direction will make the motor turn one way reversing those connections will make it turn a different direction. So all you need to do is figure out which way is going to be the easiest for you to work with as far as the direction that the motor's turning and hook those wires up that way. And every time you plug it in from that point on, it will turn that direction. And now I'm just going to unplug it and I'm going to reverse the connections, switching positive and negative outputs on the motor and changing the polarity of the voltage coming into the motor. And you'll see that the motor actually starts spinning in the opposite directions. Just set it up however you want it to turn and leave it that way. And then when you unplug it and plug it back in, it will continue to turn that direction. And that's all there is to a direct wire setup. It's really simple. It's easy to set up. You can have it set up in just a few minutes and, and ready to go as far as setting up a dryer goes. If you wanted to set up a higher speed motor, like say a 200 RPM motor and use it for something like finishing, you might even be able to get away without using a speed controller on it. I find the speed controller most handy when I'm doing wraps with it. 
because I can slow it down to start out as I make sure that I get everything lined up. Then I can increase the speed and carry on the duration of the wrap from there. So a direct wire might be fine for most people for using a dryer motor or even possibly as an epoxy finishing motor setup. Now I'm going to take that motor off of the stand and install a 200 RPM motor. And I'm going to show you this remote control unit that I'm trying out here. It's one that I found on Amazon. I'm going to show you how I hook that up. It's really easy to hook up, much easier than the last one I showed on my channel. The cost of it's quite a bit more, but the ease of hookup on it and it's really a neat package too. It's a hard plastic cased unit and it's pretty nice setup so the convenience of setup and it's a little bit better quality pulse width modulator too in my opinion it will actually slow down to a little bit slower speeds than the first one i tried out i think those two things together make me like it for myself it'd be up to you to decide if you would rather spend the extra money on that or go the cheaper route which also works just fine too as far as that goes i think both of them work well and the convenience of not having wires all over the place is really nice too. If you have a separate controller, you've got wires that are sitting on your workbench that might possibly get in your way, whereas a remote is a lot neater package, a wireless remote. The little kit comes with some screws that you can use to mount the hard plastic encased LED dimmer set up onto something with the screws if you want to do that. I'm just going to leave mine loose for now. I might decide to mount it to a base later. It's nice to have that option if you want it. When you pop the covers off the ends and see where the terminals are that you hook the wires up to, you'll notice that it's a pretty substantial setup for such a small unit. The wire lugs are all metal and they've got some fairly decent sized screws in those lugs. So it's a pretty nice setup for the connection. And there's also some sawtooth looking patterns on both sides, on both the cover and the unit itself that actually grip the wires to give you a little bit of a stress relief there on the wires keep them from pulling out i'm just going to raise this stand up as high as it'll go and use that as a rough reference for how long i want to make the wires that go from the dimmer the led dimmer up to the motor and i'm going to leave a little extra that way i've got plenty of wire and there won't be any kind of a bind or anything there in case i decide to mount this dimmer unit on the base right now i'm leaving it loose so it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference i'm just going to leave it long enough for the led dimmer to sit on the work table but i'm also going to make sure that i've got enough wire there if i decide i want to mount it to this base i can do that later and i'm just going to cut off the part of the wire that I set up earlier for the single speed motor. I'm gonna cut that off and use that as my motor connections and then tie it in to this LED dimmer unit. Then I'm just gonna take the end that I cut off and I'm gonna split those two wires and strip them back and use those as the ends that go into the output side of the dimmer unit. Then I'm gonna take the wires that are still on the wall plug, the 12 volt adapter. I'm gonna take those wires and split those and strip those ends and those will be my input wires on the LED dimmer unit. You always wanna make sure anytime you're hooking up to a pulse width modulator that you check with a meter the output coming off of the adapter unit you're using and you want to identify the positive and negative side and i'm glad i did on this one because i noticed a trend on a lot of them that there's a white striped side to the wires that usually is on the positive side well on this one that white striped wire is on the negative side so if i hadn't checked that i could have hooked this up backwards now this particular unit is supposed to have reverse polarity protection and it will just won't work. A light will come on that turns red if you get the wires hooked up backwards and then you unhook them and hook them up the right way and it should work. I don't ever want to tempt fate on that stuff. I always check the plugs and make sure I've got them positive to positive and negative to negative on the pulse width modulator input side. And even though this is an LED dimmer, they work using pulse width modulation. That's how LEDs are dimmed. So this is in fact a pulse width modulator of sorts. It's not quite as fine tuned as the standalone units, but the wireless functionality of them is something that I really like for this particular application. The input side is hooked up like it should be. I'm going to turn that off with the remote and then I'm going to move over to the output side. And on this side, positive and negative makes no difference other than the direction that your motor is going to turn. And I'm just going to 
put the stripped ends of those wires into the positive and negative side outputs and tighten those lugs down and button this thing up by putting the cover back on and just checking to make sure everything's installed tightly as it should be. It's a really easy LED controller to install on here to control the speed. A lot simpler than the soldering and, and heat shrink tubing that I used on the previous unit. But now I'm going to test it out and I'm just going to put a flag on the motor shaft here so we can see it turning. Everything worked just fine right out of the gate. I noticed that you can get away with about five down or slow down speed button pushes. If you go beyond five, it will stall the motor. So this does actually get a little slower than the other one that I tried, the less expensive one. It would get down to around 70 to 80 RPMs before it would shut off. This one, I've checked it and it gets down to around 40 RPMs before it stalls. So at about 40 RPMs under a fairly light load it will spin fine you don't want a super heavy load if you're doing extremely tight wraps or something like that it it will probably stall the motor but if you're using regular tension normal wrapping tension you can probably get it down to about 40 rpms now when you leave it at 40 rpms and turn it off and try to restart it it won't restart you've got to increase the speed enough to get it to start again, which would be closer to about the 70 to 80 RPM speed that the other one would stall out at. So you've got a, a better low range speed control on this one. I wish that you could start it at that slow of a speed and have it going. It would be a little more useful if you could. So I'm not 100% sure that this would be worth the extra money for everybody. For me, I like it a lot better. I think it's a nicer unit it's a better packaged unit uh, it's a lot easier to install for people that don't want to mess with soldering and things like that i think the quality of the unit is is actually better i wish it could start out at a little slower speed from a stop uh, but that's not a deal breaker for me because like i said the convenience of not having the wires everywhere and being able to control this with a wireless remote is really good i mean it's it's a nice way to be able to set these up so for me personally, I would spend the $20 on this controller, but I don't know that that's the right solution for everybody. And overall, a wired unit, a wired pulse width modulator like I've shown on previous videos is going to give you a lot better low end control of things. That's something to keep in mind. If you want the most low end speed control, you're going to really need to go with a wired controller. If you can get by without it, and make do then the wireless ones are really convenient and simple to install especially this one so i hope that helps y'all out um, if y'all have any requests for any other kind of motor setups or anything like that i'd be happy to try to do those if i'm able to for me right now this is the the nicest speed control unit setup i have um, i like the wireless functionality i like the lower low speed that you can get with this one as opposed to the previous one the only hang up for me is that you can't start it off at a really slow speed no that would make it just about perfect but if you've got two of these stands and you've got one set up as a direct wired drying motor and then if you've got one that you can speed up and slow down a little bit that will really increase your versatility now it's not exactly the same thing as a rod building lathe you're not going to be able to turn cork grips or anything like that with it but you can lay down a lot of thread in a hurry and you can also do some some epoxy finishing work and you can dry using this same type of motor stand set up so it's really convenient and it really adds a lot of versatility to a hand wrapping jig and the way i've designed these stands they should work with a lot of hand wrapping jigs out there if it's somewhere between approximately three and a half inches to about eight and a half inches in height from the center line of your rod to the work surface that you're working off of if you're stands fall somewhere in that range these these little motor stands should work for you because they are adjustable i hope you enjoyed this video and i hope you like the different setups and maybe you can find some use for it but that's all i've got for today i'll talk to you guys later